Okay, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about clarinet tone hole undercutting. And just to start, we're going to talk about the recorder at first because it's easy to see. I'm going to do a quick close up of what I'm talking about with tone holes in the bore. So while we're looking at this real quickly here, we can see that the tone holes are strictly cylindrical. I'm using this so that we can actually see what I'm talking about. And of course they're cut right straight down to the bore, which is also cylindrical. So let's, let's just see what the basics of a tone hole on a recorder. Before we get to looking at uh, images of actual undercutting, I want to show you a picture here. This is from a 1960s Noble ad. And you can see the cylindrical tone hole and as it gets close to the board flares out. The description is integral raised flare cut tone holes permit use of smaller tone holes for easier fingering. Instant response helps prevent squeaking. All right, what we're first going to do is we're going to take a look at the tone hole undercutting using my probe of a Schreiber made Buffet B12 student clarinet. Okay, we are right to that. So, what I'm doing here is pushing in a borescope probe down the clarinet. We start seeing some trill keys here. Another trill key, you can actually see undercutting there. This is the on the left see those top two trill keys. You can actually see undercutting them, but we'll get to the other ones right, right here. Now, if you look around the circular part up on top, you'll see below it is phrased or it's cut out, it's open wider. And the, as you move down and see more of these, these are all undercutting. This is the F sharp ring key. The first ring key, which is open, I can see my ceiling. Uh, the first, the B flat ring key, which is pad covered. Once again, I can see the ceiling again, the second ring key. You can see dust in here and some garbage too. <laughs> and this is the C, G, third finger open hole. Fairly a large oh, amount of phrasing on those keys. This is top pad above the three rings of the lower joint, the first ring key. Second ring key with a lot of phrasing on here related to the bore shape. Third one is not much there. Now we're getting to the, we're just getting to the two right bell keys. You can see there's cutting to enlarge there a little bit. And then the last one on the bottom, lowest tone hole. Next, we're going to take a look at a Buffet R13. This is a serial number of 92490. This is mine. We're going to look at the upper and lower joint at the same time. We'll get right to that. As we move through the R13, we're going to see the wood grain we see inside of it. And we're going to see, I really haven't cleaned it in ages. And... I have multiple R13s that I play up and I play primarily the RC Prestige. So this clarinet hasn't been touched in ages really. But I can see I need to go in there with Q-tips and clean each tone hole now. Take key work off, clean all the tone holes. But we can see the undercutting here. I don't think it's as big as on the B12 because B12 has smaller tone holes for student fingers. Uh, we can see though that wood of course isn't as perfect because the material gets a little bit nicks here and there. But we go down and see everything. Like that one tone hole there had a lot of rough around the edges. And as we move down, we now get to the lower joint. This is the top pad key of the lower joint. And as you move down, we'll get down to the first finger key, first ring key. So you can see a big, large oval undercut there. That's because of the shape of the bore and the undercutting tool is circular. It's my finger there, third ring key. Then we get to the, just the right hand side the pad keys there. Mm 
and lowest pad key there. And that's it for the Buffet R13. Now these are the tools used for undercutting. Uh, the long bar going from the top left to the top right is just a holding one. It's where you put one of the undercutters on it. You push it into the bore and use one of the three T ones where you screw into the top of the undercutter and then you end up bringing that up and then cutting the undercutting. You don't want to overdo it. You can basically completely screw up a clarinet by doing it that way and we'll get into the technical reasons next. What I want to review here real quickly is a article from Yamaha. Um, basically how clarinet is made, making the body, they have the wood, they cut it down, the segments, they make it in the cylinders, you know, they polish the body, they uh, cut a bore out of it, a beginning bore, not a final bore. They start processing it. And they get to the undercutting here. We can see here, you have a body here with a bore and you have a tone hole that comes in. <clears throat> it's, it's cut down with a cylindrical tone hole. Then they start bringing a cutter into position, handle is screwed in, and then it's raised up from the outside and it basically starts and creates the undercut as it's complete right there. A very simple process, but you have to be very careful. You don't wanna bring, when you bring up the cutter, it's very, it's easier done by machine than hand. You have to make sure you bring it up directly straight up, not at an angle, because that can affect things ever so slightly. We'll get into the reasons why in just a minute. But that's basically the a Yamaha definition of how you do undercutting. What I want to review now is an article by Clark Forbes. This is on his website. In this part of his article, he talks about raising the pitch, undercutting, reshaping tone holes. And basically phrasing is a French word to drill a countersink. He mentions generally large bore clarinets, such as the older series nine and center tone, have la rather large tone holes with no undercutting. On my center tones, I had several of them. I remember I could stick my third finger into the tone hole itself, not by much, by 16th of an inch. So when I played a center tone, I'd be really careful and really light to cover the tone hole. But they can have really big tone holes. And, uh, and large tone holes produce a very sonorous sound, but it creates problems in the 12th. 12th, that's why the center tone kind of evolved. The first generation center tone was strictly cylindrical, the second generation was more of a taper board in the upper joint to help on the 12th. And I mentions here, usually very sharp and tremolo and playing, you know, very lightly uh, pianissimo. And he mentions the introduction of the R13 was a move towards a smaller bore and highly phrased or undercut tone holes to produce better 12s. Now there's a book he mentions here, Dr. Lee Gibson. I've had a copy of this book for a long time. That's what it looks like. Clarinet Acoustics, Lee Gibson. And he mentions, he wrote an article in there, a good description of undercutting and its effects on pitch. He goes on to, per to mention the purpose of undercutting is to raise the pitch of the fundamental and improve the voicing. When a tone hole is undercut, the fun fundamental tone is sharpened. He also goes on about the importance of being cautious doing this. If you do a little bit too much, you can basically ruin an instrument. Um, so you gotta understand how to do it and you really want to do it on the upper portions first and then the lower portions, upper or the lower joint just a little bit then. But you really have to be very minor in the undercutting if you do it at all. Most of the time, there's a lot of clarinet people technicians who will repad a clarinet or recork it. And if they're charging a little amount, $99, or $199, even $299, usually they may not be top-notch clarinet technicians. They'll use too thick of cork, which will not allow the key to open as much as it should. The pads may be too thick. A lot of voicing concerns they may have. So you shouldn't even consider undercutting until you've had a top-notch refurbishment done. Because usually that corrects most problems for people. Once in a while, you may need to do some undercutting or correction of undercutting. If you saw the video of my R13 that I haven't actually touched or cleaned in years, it's one of the ones I just started using again after giving my daughter my RC Prestige. And I'm not even sure that was my one that I was using before. It just happened to have been one case I just grabbed and started using. But it needs a thorough cleaning and everything now. 
But anyways, you have to be very cautious about it. And he mentions here when he tends to adjust pitch upwards is not strictly undercutting, but he also adjusts the shape of the top of the chimney of the undercutting. But I'm going to give a link of this article in my Google Drive for you to read some more with other articles too. But that's basically Clark Forbes. He has a website and he has clarinet saxophone products too. And I'll give a link to that. Now, in the description, I put a link to a bunch of articles I have now in my Google Drive that you can read about undercutting. Um, if I were to read about them and talk about them, we'd be here for the next hour. So there's just a link down there. We can get to more detail in the future. And I'll also do an article about overcutting. Please give it a thumbs up, like, share, and subscribe. And we'll see you later.